Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sam Kandala, and I'm part of uh, G Healthcare. I promise I'll keep it uh, short, so I won't stay between uh, you and the lunch here. So, uh, um, yeah. So today's uh, topic, I want to uh, go through a little bit about how we are think generally. What's the trends in oncology uh, as it relates to artificial intelligence? and broadly how the industry is looking at this space. And last but not least, as G Healthcare, we, uh, how we are supporting this cancer care ecosystem uh, with respect to the artificial intelligence. By the way, my background is I'm engineer by training, so any deep medical questions, I'll be probably uh, dodging that, so please bear that in mind. Uh, so with that, but of course, we are very passionate. I, we work a lot with uh, closely with uh, the medical community in terms of understanding the requirements, what's needed uh, in this space. So hopefully you'll see some of uh, the work we are doing in this. Uh, so firstly, uh, cancer, as many of you uh, are aware and probably be touched through the family um, uh, in your close friends and all. It's uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, disease burdens in the, in the uh, humanity here. Uh, depending on the region, it's either number one or uh, number two killer uh, when it comes to the care pathway. And as you've seen, uh, seeing here, uh, there's a huge burden across the globe, uh, 18 million uh, cancer patients, and it's uh, projected to increase almost by 60% in the next uh, few years. And as you see uh, the chart on the right side, uh, it's quite uh, disparate, right? I mean, uh, it's not equally distributed across the globe. Uh, most of it is coming from uh, Asia for several reasons, either the demographics there or access to the care uh, and several factors like that. Uh, when it comes to the top uh, three, four uh, anatomies that are impacted by cancer, it's uh, uh, lung, for females it's breast, uh, for men it's prostate, and uh, the bowel cancers as well. <coughs> so how is the uh, global community reacting to the cancer, and what are some of the trends that are uh, kind of under discussion, right? So the Union for International Cancer Council is looking at this space in the following four areas. The first one is around how do you make the cancer data access globally uh, for medical research when it comes to either clinical trials or uh, routine care within the system because of all the complexity involved in the multimodal data analysis and so on. The second one is the biggest um, <coughs> area in this, which is around, uh, I mean, the key principle of cancer essentially is like if you find the cancer early, you can treat it much better so that the patients don't have to go through uh, complex procedures and also create a, a significant burden in both from a patient perspective as well as from the healthcare perspective. So there's a lot of focus and uh, work going on in um, early detection of the cancer. The third area is around timely and accurate treatment. So this is again, there is uh, no one size fits all. So historically it has been like a one treatment modality approach versus others, whereas now it's going to be more and more around combination therapies, uh, putting patients through some of the early clinical trials uh, of therapies like stem cell immunotherapy and so on. Uh, last but not the least, uh, how do you uh, ensure the, the, the disease doesn't relapse and if the patient doesn't have to go through the same process again um, or even extend the life uh, of the patient, right? So this is the fourth area. All in all, I think uh, the key conclusion and, and most of the work that's been happening uh, within the industry, government consortium is around like, there is no one size fits all approach in the cancer care. So there is, it has to be a lot more precision, personalized, uh, so that you get the right outcomes uh, at the right time. So given this backdrop, uh, so how we are, or rather how industry is looking, the academics, uh, the med tech industry and other pharma companies are in this space. So I listed few areas when it comes to how AI is already helping uh, the cancer care continuum. Uh, so I listed few different areas which we'll touch uh, uh, at a high level uh, by some case studies. Uh, so if you look at the clinical care pathway, uh, so like I was mentioning uh, earlier, Finding cancer care early is a big area, so how AI is improving that, so I'll show a couple of examples. Then the second one is once you find the cancer, you have to uh, accurately say whether it's a po false positive or a false, uh, I mean, a real positive or a false positive, you need to make sure that uh, a diagnosis is accurate. Then the third one is around selecting the right treatment. 
this is a big area around like select, uh, both selecting the right treatment for the patient and also the right uh, patient for the treatment as well. So the, this is another area uh, AI is helping a lot. The fourth one is around uh, once you select the treatment, how do you actually deliver it so that you uh, actually attack the tumor and spare the healthy organs. So this is another area where uh, AI is playing a major role. So the last but not the least uh, on the right side here is in the research and clinical trials. So this is more around identifying the biomarkers using multimodal data sets to kind of uh, figure out what's actually causing the cancer and how do you uh, uh, prescribe the treatment across the care pathway. Okay, so if we go uh, deeper into the clinical care pathway story here. So the first one, as I mentioned about finding uh, cancer early. So I listed a couple of examples here that are proven to be quite successful in terms of uh, leveraging AI for detecting uh, breast uh, cancer on the left and here on the right side it's uh, cervical cancer. The first one on the left is actually a program that's uh, Boston based uh, in collaboration with MIT and MGH uh, where the team has developed a AI model uh, that's based on mammograms and it was trained with like multiple uh, thousands of images. I think if I remember right, it's around like uh, 90,000 images. And the intent of this is uh, if the patient gets a mammogram and that image goes through this tool, uh, that can predict if the patient has a, a potential to develop a breast cancer in the next five years. So it's, this is kind of an early detection uh, type of an area. And the reason this type of models are being used is uh, to uh, design the cancer screening programs because screening uh, is a big uh, debatable area where people refuse to get screened and things like that. So models like this can help make the judgment of like the public health uh, policies. <coughs> the second one on the right here is, uh, this is uh, from, a, I believe, an Israeli company. So they, they are using a handheld device. It's called canploscope. Uh, so the idea here is to quickly do a screening of the cervical scan cancers, if, if there is or not. Uh, they, they have AI built into this device that is trained by multiple uh, 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 real uh, data from different patients in the past. So the doctor can quickly assess if there is a early signs of uh, cervical cancer or not. So there is a couple of examples, uh, but there are a lot more. Uh, and and uh, leveraging tools like this. Uh, there have been uh, discussions in American Cancer Society and other, other, other uh, public health bodies like wh when to start screening programs and how often the patient needs to go through the screening programs. <coughs> so the first one is about detecting, uh, uh, predict finding cancer early and this one is about uh, um, uh, assessing the cancer more accurately. Uh, so a couple of examples here, one is on the prostate cancer on the left and the, uh, the other one is on the lung cancer. When it comes to the prostate cancer, uh, it's a very notorious uh, uh, tumor and it's very hard to find uh, on the prostate and historically MRI has been uh, the major tool to diagnose prostate cancer. Of course, once you point the location, you, uh, you take the other uh, pathology tests and things like that. But what? But what we are highlighting here is a new technique called multi-parameter uh, MRI study. And that's, uh, uh, that's a scanning technique of an MRI where it gives much more uh, biomarker, uh, not, not a straightforward biomarker information, but also like a initial uh, uh, signs of a cancer. Uh, but it's a very complex information and it's very difficult for a regular radiologist to read. So what AI is doing is take the multi-parameter MI and kind of pointing uh, to the radiologist that there is a potentially an aggressive prostate tumor. So that's, uh, for, uh, for example, in the prostate. And equally on the lung side, the issue with the lung uh, images is on the CT, there is a chance for a lot of false positives, which, which is uh, actually uh, even more scary than the real positive, right? So the, you're traumatizing the patient and they have to go through all sorts of uh, different things here. I believe this is a program uh, with Google uh, AI lab. They have uh, developed an algorithm to kind of uh, detect uh, what is a false positive on the, based on the lung cancer. Again, it's an example of uh, AI case. 
Uh, just extending on that, this is a, a workflow technology uh, related to the GE products. Uh, so we have a combination of uh, uh, coils for MRI on the left side uh, and uh, an ability to reconstruct the image at a much faster and more, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, much m uh, more streamlined when it comes to the technician variability and how do you present that image uh, meeting the PIRAT score standards. So uh, essentially this suite of solution can enable the radiologist to uh, do a quick prostate workflow exam in 15 minutes. So now coming to the cancer treatment aspect of uh, the AI. Uh, so what I'm showing here is an example of uh, a, bla a patient with a bladder cancer. And, and normally without the AI, uh, uh, it is very difficult for uh, the doctor to know whether the cancer is spreading beyond the bladder and going into the lymph nodes um, and, and things like that. So the normal course of treatment is a surgery for a patient like this uh, without AI. Uh, so with this particular technique, uh, uh, what we can do is uh, the tumor, uh, the, the tissue pathology, you can segment it and then you can analyze it more and see if there is uh, any other lymph nodes on the adjacencies that are getting, uh, 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 getting attacked by the cancer. So what will happen after this is the doctor will prescribe along with surgery a chemotherapy treatment dose as well so that you kind of protect the surrounding uh, area. A few more examples of selecting the patients as well as the selecting the treatment. Uh, so we are also looking at, uh, I mean, not only G, several other companies are looking at the immuno-oncology space. Uh, as much as immuno-oncology is promising for uh, uh, leukemia and other uh, kind of uh, um, uh, cancers, the, the biggest issue is the uncertainty of the side effects for the patient. So what uh, multimodal AI can help is to uh, look at the data sets coming from different modalities, and then we can start predict the uh, toxicities and efficacies uh, for this treatment. So this is a partnership that we have with Vanderbilt University and we have already developed clinical models that are being used to select the patients for treatment but also for clinical trials. Uh, this is a new, new field that is coming in uh, cancer, especially now with prostate cancer called theranostics. Uh, it's, a, it's a nuclear medicine field. Uh, it, you give a radioactive drug that goes directly where the cancer is and it, think of it as like a small nuclear bomb going into the human body, but it's a targeted nuclear bomb, right? So again, the, the, the pain point is the same like the immunotherapy. It's still uncertain, uh, the community is figuring out which patients will be benefited and how much dose should be given and so on. So SNMMI, which is the Society for Nuclear um, uh, Molecular Medicine, um, they are creating something called a Raptor database. So to get data sets from multiple different institutes, multimodality data sets, and on, um, then they apply AI on top of it to figure out which patients are uh, benefiting from this treatment. So that's, uh, again, uh, uh, a use case for uh, using AI and deep learning for selecting the therapy for patients. So this one is actually a use case around how do you uh, uh, deliver the therapy appropriately to the patient. So this particular example is for uh, radiation therapy. Um, and, and the use case is uh, you have to really define where the tumor is and where the healthy organ is so that you don't put the powerful radiation uh, into the healthy organ, right? So. Uh, again, uh, AI, uh, so the definition of tumor versus healthy organ, you do it manually today for the most part, and it's super time consuming. I mean, organ is probably easy because the shape of organs are more or less uh, defined, whereas a tumor is very uncertain shape. So anyway, I think the key, key point here is, again, uh, there's a lot of uh, work going on uh, in AI and deep learning to uh, automate this process. So just to give you a context, this process can normally take uh, two, three days today and a manual process, whereas AI is uh, doing that in 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, so those are some of the clinical uh, cases. So we talked about detect how to detect cancer early using AI. Then how do you uh, uh, qualify the cancer accurately uh, using AI, then selecting the patients as well as delivering the treatment. So the last couple of pages here is around uh, use of uh, multimodality data for clinical trials. 
the broad context here is to kind of understand the biomarkers and uh, uh, the genesis of what's causing a particular cancer versus other. Uh, so this page here is, um, I mean, you can use different platforms. Uh, one of the platforms we are using in GE is called Edison. The, the, the idea here is to kind of bring uh, data sets of different modalities. Most of the cases you have seen before are unimodal data sets. Uh, all AI uh, deep learning is doing is to uh, simplify, streamline the process to make uh, workflows faster, but also uh, enabling things that are not uh, easily caught by the human eye. Whereas here, uh, you're actually looking that plus uh, different data sets. Uh, so the, the most common uh, aspect is around integrating radiology data, uh, data then also uh, uh, omics, it can be genomics or proteomics data along with uh, the e classic EMR data as well. Uh, one such example here is around uh, a field called radio genomics and the idea here is to kind of look at uh, the radiology data then leveraging that uh, go one level deeper with your omics data sets uh, this particular example is again going back to the prostate cancer uh, with MRI data as well as omics data. And finally, uh, combining those two data, AI will actually uh, kind of uh, reveal the molecular patterns and biological patterns of the particular biomarker. So again, all this is going to be used in terms of uh, figuring out the new drugs and how which patients should go through a particular clinical trial and so on. I'll kind of skip this slide because it's more or less a summary of uh, what I've uh, just mentioned earlier. But, but this is a key, key slide, especially for the medtech community. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of obviously excitement around AI and there is, uh, I think the, even the skepticism is probably uh, turning more, uh, uh, is becoming lesser and lesser. But I guess uh, uh, there are three key things here, right? So. Uh, which are valid questions. I think we'll come to the positives here in a second. But the first one is around the big question, uh, how will, uh, for example, if there is an AI model that's deployed in a clinic, uh, how will that perform over time? Uh, because it's it gets trained with a certain set of data. And then, I mean, there's also a debate around uh, equity, right? I mean, uh, is, there, is the model being trained with uh, uh, diverse data sets, complex cases, and so on and so forth. So. I think FDA is uh, coming up with a framework to kind of keep an eye on the deployed models uh, so that it performs consistently and reliably over time. But on the good news side, I think uh, there, uh, this is not just an oncology number here, uh, uh, generally uh, for all of the medical community. So it's uh, FDA so far has uh, approved 500 more AI-enabled devices. Um, and as you can see, there, uh, the split is the following there. Uh, but yeah, I think all in all, uh, we at GE uh, have certainly uh, taken a strong interest in AI, uh, not only just for oncology, but across the care continuum. And, and uh, what you have seen, particularly in oncology, I think, uh, in summary, the big uh, multimodality aspects of the care pathway is, I think, a big area because cancer is a very complex field. And the more and more you understand the genesis of where it's coming from, which is a true multimodal problem and detecting the cancer early and uh, attacking it is probably the right way to uh, help the humanity of things. So with that, uh, I'm uh, available for any questions.